Great. Okay. It's a pleasure to introduce Patricia Klein from Minnesota, speaking about bumpless pipe dreams uh, that encode Gröbner geometry of Schubert polynomials. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and for the invitation. Uh, and thank you all for being here. Um, what I'll talk about today is joint work with Anna Wygant, who's currently at MIT. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is intersections and unions of matrix Schubert varieties. How can we break apart matrix Schubert varieties and what do we get when we sum the ideals? So let's start with a small example. Um, so the, the small example will really think, be thinking about um, the Schubert determinantal ideal of 1, 5, 3, 2, 4, breaking apart as a sum of these easier Schuberts. So um, the conventions today will be that we fill in our rota diagrams. Um, as this one tells me one in the first column, the five is giving me a five in the second column, and so on. And we might notice that this is just a uh, one little ladder shape here. So this is already, we can either call this a one-sided ladder determinantal ideal, or uh, it's a vexillary matrix Schubert variety. And what we're taking here are just the size two minors inside of this little ladder. And we can decompose this as a sum um, of two by Grassmannian uh, permutations. So the um, by Grassmannian algebraically is just going to mean that we have one essential box. And we're just taking minors northwest of that one spot. So one size minor, one location of interest. Um, so size two minors northwest of this one location, size two minors northwest of this one location here. And this is a very friendly sum. We sum two Schuberts, we get another one. And um, it's maybe not so difficult to believe that we can break apart any um, Schubert determinantal ideal into a sum of these Bygrassmannian Schuberts in just this way, where we take each essential cell and we form the uh, Schubert determinantal ideal of the Bygrassmannian that is given by that one rank condition in that one location. And we sum them up and we get all of our rank conditions. So let's see how this looks in the rank tables. Um, so these rank tables, they agree in awful lot of locations, but they disagree, for example, um, in this location there. And so we notice that the, the value of our rank table um, in the sum is the lesser of the two possible values coming from the two rank tables of the permutations whose ideals we're adding. Um, so similarly, here we have a two and a one compete and we get a one. And in some sense, of course, we get the, the minimum value because if in, we're getting more relations, so that means as we sum ideals, so we're insisting on more rank conditions. So for example, um, this, ideal here is insisting that we be uh, rank at most two. Sorry, uh, yeah, rank at most rank at most one, so the two by two minors have to vanish um, here. And so, and we don't get that insistence from this permutation. And so it's the stronger of the insistences that tells us uh, which, which number to, let's see, um, to fill in as, as a rank condition. So when, the, when we're summing ideals and we're trying to form the appropriate rank table, we're gonna take the smaller of the two values um, coming from the ideals we're summing. So this is a very friendly way to take our favorite Schubert determinantal ideal and instead just study, uh, if we're willing to understand sums, these by Grassmannian permutations. Here's another very, friendly looking sum. Um, this permutation here is not only by Grassmannian, but it's dominant. It's just one variable. Um, and this is just another by Grassmannian permutation. This is two by two minors and a generic two by three matrix. And again, we're gonna form this rank table by taking the minimum um, of the two values that we see. So we see a zero there and a one there, we choose the zero and so on. And so maybe we hope that this is also going to be another um, Schubert determinantal ideal. 
So let's take this rank table that we've gotten and try to make a zero one matrix that gives us these rank conditions. So if the, the rank zero part has to be just this one cell here, that's telling us that we have to be rank one there and rank one there. So we have to have those two dots. And now, unfortunately, we see that we have to be rank one here. And in order to, to get a rank one in our rank table, we would have to stand on this square here and look northwest and count one dot, but we already have two dots and so there's no hope. So there is no way to, to take this rank table um, and fill in a, a permutation matrix. So it is not the case that sums of Schubert determinantal ideals are Schubert, which is kind of a shame because we, you know, we like Northwest rank conditions. Um, some of them sum so easily. Wouldn't it be nice if we could understand all of these Northwest rank conditions? So um, let's record our observations that we've made. One of them is that every Schubert determinantal ideal can be expressed as a sum of Schubert determinantal ideals by Grassmannians. And the second uh, more concerning observation is that it is not the case that if we sum two Schubert, Schubert determinantal ideals, we necessarily get a Schubert determinantal ideal. So let's take an arbitrary sum of Schubert determinantal ideals and call it um, I sub A. So, there are a lot of things that are good about Schubert determinantal ideals, and we might wonder how many of them are true for these sums. So must this sum be radical? We know that Schubert determinantal ideals are radical. Is this sum still going to be radical? Schubert determinantal ideals are Cohen-Macaulay. Um, is this sum going to be Cohen-Macaulay? Is it height unmixed? So if it's radical, then unmixed would just be the same as equidimensional. And so do we, do we at least have that? More generally, what is the co-dimension? How do we understand the minimal primes? And is there any combinatorial structure that can help us understand these, these IA? These IA, they're just going to be any ideal given by Northwest rank conditions. And some good news um, is that, yes, these IA are all radical. Um, that's due to Anna Wygant. And um, are they necessarily Cohen Macaulay? Unfortunately, no. Are they necessarily quite unmixed? Also, no. Um, and it's not the failure of Cohen Macaulay ness doesn't just come from um, mineral primes of the wrong height. We can have things that are equidimensional, um, but not Cohen Macaulay. So, how do we understand the co dimension? Uh, is there any combinatorial structure? So those are questions we'll consider as we go forward. Um, but before we think more about, about these, um, I want to convince you that these two are, are questions worth asking. Um, so maybe the Cohen-Macaulay property is not as near and dear to your heart as it is to mine, um, and similarly unmixedness. So suppose that we're interested in enumerative geometry. Um, should we care about our varieties being equidimensional? I think that we should. And one way to think about this geometrically is that um, the, we might care about the degree of a variety. So the degree of a variety is take your favorite projective variety and intersect with um, hyperplanes in general position until we get down to finitely many points of intersection, count those finitely many points. Um, if I take, for example, a plane with a line through it in free space, and I pass another line through this variety, that will get me down to finitely many points of intersection. This line that I started with, it's not doing anything. These two lines in free space, I can pull apart. I can just wiggle them apart, and this gives me no additional points of intersection. So the number of points of intersection comes only from the top dimensional pieces. And for that reason, we should prefer that our varieties be equidimensional. Algebraically, the statement would be that the, um, the Hilbert polynomial gets its top dimensional information from the top dimensional pieces of the variety. And these things like a line through a plane, the line contributes lower order terms. 
So it's not telling us about the normalized leading coefficient of the Hilbert polynomial. The normalized leading coefficient of the Hilbert polynomial is the degree. So algebraically and geometrically, we're really interested in the top dimensional components. And so we value our varieties that are equidimensional. Um, for cohen macauliness uh, in case you, so if you have uh, never seen a definition before, I basically wouldn't read this slide. Um, if you have seen a definition before and like one of them and want to be reminded, here they are. Um, and if you know the definition well, then you can kind of also skip this slide. Um, but geometrically, how do we picture something that's cohen macaulay So the maximal ideal is not embedded and we can slice with the generic hyperplane section and the maximal ideal is still not embedded. We can keep doing that and the maximal ideal never becomes embedded. Um, and then eventually we're down to something dimension zero. And so there isn't room for the maximal ideal to be embedded. It's just the only associated primes. It's the only prime in, around. And from the standpoint of enumerative geometry, why do we value cohen macauliness Why do we like it that the maximal ideal isn't embedded? So one answer to that question comes from Sarah's intersection formula. So there is a, a way that we can algebraically compute the intersection number um, in terms of this alternating sum of lengths of tors. And alternating sums of lengths of tors are unpleasant. <laughs> um, they're, they're often difficult to compute. And in the cohen macaulay setting, this intersection number, this computation just simplifies down to tor zero. And tor zero is just um, S mod, the sum of the ideals determining my variety. So in the cohen macaulay setting, we are well equipped to count points at intersection. So if we care about a numerator of geometry, we should care about the cohen macaulay property. So it is a real feature of uh, matrix Hubert varieties and something that we're looking for as we consider these other ideals determining Northwest ring conditions. So let's return to our example. Um, this, this sum of these two uh, by Grassmannian uh, Schubert determinantal ideals that we saw. Uh, here's the rank table, just the rank table that we produced before, or rather than, you know, was there. And I, I looked at a couple of slots and took the smaller value. And um, a fact about this rank table is that it can be determined in the same way that we get rank tables from permutation matrices coming from this matrix A. So this matrix A is what's called an alternating sign matrix. So its entries live in 0, 1, and negative 1. And in each column and in each row, when we sum, we get a 1. Moreover, um, any row that has a negative 1 has to start with a 1, end in a 1, and alternate 1, negative 1, 1, negative 1 throughout its non-zero entries. Same thing for every column. That's the alternating part of the alternating sign matrix. So how do we get this rank table? Well, we take this corner sum. So for example, if I want to know what rank goes here, then I carve out this part of my ASM and I add up the entries in that Northwest corner. So I get one plus one plus negative one is one. And that tells me to put a rank of one there. Um, similarly here, for example, I would say one plus one plus one plus negative one is two. And that tells me to be rank two there. And so just like when we're forming a Schubert determinantal ideal, when we form an ASM ideal, what we do is we plunk down a generic matrix and we say that we have to be rank at most one in this corner. So that tells us that the two by two minor there has to vanish. That it turns out is uh, this term because we already have this one by one term in this corner. Um, or here, for example, we have to be rank at most one northwest of that corner. So we get this, the two by two matrix that lives in this location as one of the generators for our ideal. So um, this ASM, that's really a, just a generalization of uh, Schubert determinantal ideals, because when we have no negative ones here, when we just have ones and zeros, then we have a permutation matrix. Um, we're interested in it because it arises as whatever Northwest rank conditions we want. And 
a feature of it is that it decomposes into an intersection of these other Schubert determinantal ideals. So um, here are two other Schubert determinantal ideals. These are both co-dimension three, because one, two, three, and one, two, three. And the number of boxes in our rota diagram tells us the co-dimension of the ideal. And so this IA, uh, it is height unmixed, um, and its co-dimension is three because here are its two associated primes. They are both co-dimension three. So again, we like uh, alternating sign matrix varieties because they are the ideals that tell us about anything described by Northwest rank conditions. And there's something that we know how to study in part because they're decomposing as this intersection of Schubert determinantal ideals. So, um, Alternating sign matrices, you know, did they just sort of come out of nowhere? Is it, does it happen that they, you know, describe these Northwest rank conditions? Are, are they only there to describe Northwest rank conditions? Um, the answer is no, they were alternating sign matrices have been around for a while. Um, they show up in statistical mechanics and they're um, of a lot of interest in um, enumerative combinatorics where uh, counting the alternating sign matrix alternating sign matrices um, was a big deal. And in the 90s, um, Zalberger and Cooperberg have these competing uh, proofs for the right enumeration. So alternating sign matrices are of interest of their own. And it turns out that they show up as the right combinatorial object to uh, describe all ideals of Northwest conditions. Um, so here's the formal description of an ASM, and it's just the, um, you know, the formalization of the example that we just did, where an alternating sign matrix is an n by n matrix with zero ones and negative ones. Um, and again, the rules are that rows and columns each sum to one, and the non-zero entries alternate one negative one, one negative one, one. Um, ASMs that don't have negative ones are uh, permutation matrices, and we can form these um, alternating sign matrix ideals um, in the same way that we form Schubert determinantal ideals. So some theorems due to Anna Wygant um, are that these ideals are not just set theoretically carving out um, these, these Northwest ring conditions, but they are actually the right um, defining ideal for the variety. That is, they're radical. Um, when we sum ASMs, we get other ASMs. So if we start from these by Grassmannian permutations, we can sum as many of them or as few of them as we want and still get an ASM. And uh, we can repeat the process. Um, and there is a combinatorial way to break up alternating sign matrix, alternating ASM ideals as um, Schubert determinantal ideals. So there is a, um, a lattice of ASMs. And if we restrict to the permutation matrices, this is just the post set um, that is under strong uh, Bruja order. So the, this perm of A, what this is, is these are the, um, the smallest uh, in Bruja order um, permutations that live above uh, the alternating sign matrix A. And so the this decomposition of ideals uh, can be read off directly from the combinatorics. Um, are there, so maybe now is actually a good time to, to stop and take uh, any questions if there are, are any. Okay, or let's, uh, if there are no questions, let's do our five minute pause now. I guess the recommendation is that the, the part after intermission should never be longer than the part before, and yet that's what we're gonna do in this case. Okay, thanks very much for the first part. And um, yeah, we will have, a, a, let's say six minute break, which means we'll start again at 4.27.